Welcome to Alchemical Science. I'm Jordan, an open source researcher. So you may have noticed that I've been really focused on Malcolm Bendel's mathematics and theory lately. And reasonably so, I feel, uh, because it's absolutely mind-blowing in its own right. But this has meant that I have left the practical tech side of things sitting on the back burner for a little bit. It's time we remedy that and I'll be spending the next few videos delving into all the new information that's been released on the technology. There are a lot of incredibly exciting things happening with the thunderstorm generator at the moment and we'll find out what they are. I've got a bunch of photos that Malcolm personally sent me of the build to show you all um, and they make thing, a lot of things very clear about the design and I'm also going to give you a ton of specs that I've picked up along the way so get your pens ready if you're trying to build one. And I'm sorry about my voice, I've been quite ill this week, but it must go on. So as I'm filming this video, Malcolm's presenting the Thunderstorm Generator at a conference in Zurich, in Switzerland, with a group of other scientists who have been working on the tech. And the footage of this conference should be online within a couple days, so stay tuned and I'll let you know where you can find that in a future update. Malcolm has also promised to give me a dump of unedited footage from their recent trials, so we have a lot more content to come on the Generator soon. An excellent technical review of the generator has recently been released, written by Nikita Volk, and I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name correctly there, Nikita. And he's a chemical engineer who's been prototyping the tech himself, and he was present for Malcolm's initial unveiling of the prototype at Tesla Tech with his mass spectrometer, uh, which he was featured in those videos, if you saw those. We're going to look at some key points and diagrams in his paper a bit later in this video. In the meantime, Bob Grainier from the uh, Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project has been with Malcolm while he's working on the large-scale industrial generator retrofit in the UK, and they recently published a series of videos filmed at the test site of Malcolm and Bob performing tests and making observations about the retrofit. And once again, uh, even on this larger scale build, we will see that the exhaust analysis results are coming in very similar to all of those previous tests we've seen. An enormous reduction in carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and hydrocarbons and a proportional increase in oxygen. And we'll get to those results in a moment. For those who don't know, the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project is an open research group facilitated by Bob Grainier and Ryan Hunt to continue the work of the late electrochemist Martin Fleischmann on researching low energy nuclear reactions. And they've done some amazing work in this field, and I encourage you to go and check out their channel and their website, which I'll link below in the description. Malcolm Bendel also happens to have a close tie with Martin Fleischmann. Uh, Malcolm stayed with him at his home a few months before Martin passed away, where they discussed plasmoids, cold fusion, Malcolm's ideas for advancing the technology. Malcolm promised Martin that he would finish the job that Martin had started, so hence the significance of this collaboration and the mutual interest of the two parties. So just a quick announcement that I've opened up the membership option for the channel. Uh, you can click on that little button below the video and become a member of Alchemical Science. And this just helps support uh, my open source research, what I'm doing here in the channel. But also I'm going to be offering a few little perks with that. And the first one that I'm offering is just that you can download any of the PowerPoints for, that I use for my videos. And so that'll just give you access to all of the images in them. You want to go and zoom in on something or you want to use some of the designs that myself or my wife Emma has made up for our videos, you're welcome to them. Um, and you can just download those and take a look. So if you're interested, feel free to sign up. If you're not interested, that's fine. All my videos are just going to be here. There's not going to be any hidden ones on the membership channel. So um, you're not really missing out on anything that I would have given you anyway. So thank you very much. But on to the industrial retrofit. Malcolm gives us plenty of juicy specs while he's chatting about the build here. So first of all, the specs of the industrial generator itself. It's the 30,000 cc Perkins mains gas motor, so running on methane primarily. And this motor drives a 300 kilowatt max electrical generator, which is used to produce power for the mains electrical grid. It's managed by a computer controlled system, and this has been specifically tuned to account for the thunderstorm generator retrofit. The thunderstorm generator retrofit itself is built on the principles of sacred geometry, ratios, and angles. The specs for this build are as follows. 
There are two spheres to direct the flow of the vortexing gases, one guiding the output from the exhaust into the pipe, the other guiding the output of the plasmoid generator bubbler into the other end of the pipe in the opposing direction. The dimensions of both sets of spheres is the same. The outer sphere has a diameter of 24 inches, the inner sphere has a diameter of 18 inches. It doesn't look like there was a third inner guide sphere in this design, but if there was, it would be 12 inches. The ratio is the most important factor here. It must always be 4, 3, 2. One last note on the spheres. If you go and check out the videos on the Fleischmann Memorial Project channel, you can see quite a bizarre phenomena where during the trials, one of the spheres imploded, creating a perfectly symmetrical indent, as I showed here. That's some serious electromagnetic force to symmetrically implode solid steel like this. Where did it go? <laughs> Next we have the specs of the pipes. The outer pipe being 6 inches in diameter, the inner pipe being 4 inches in diameter. And again, the important factor here being that the ratio of the outer pipe to the inner is the ratio of 3 to 2. Malcolm also gives the angle of the transition between the spheres and the pipes, and this is 51.84 degrees. If you study any, any of my videos on the mathematical theory of the plasmoid unification model, uh, you should know the significance of all those numbers quite well by now. He doesn't mention it in these videos, but we already know that the length of the pipes must be 144 inches, or an octave of 144 inches. If you're not sure what I mean by that, uh, you must learn your A432 physical scale. It's going to come in handy for this stuff. Check out my video part 2 of the plasmoid unification model, uh, the music of the spheres, to explore that topic more. Next we can find the water consumption of the unit is about 5 litres per week. It's not exactly consumption though, as most of this water ends up in the water trap, uh, which is between the bubbler and the generator on this build. It just means the water needs to be returned or replaced into the initial chamber at a rate of around 5 litres per week, with you know a small negligible amount lost. There is very little actual consumption of the water. The water is more just a catalyst fluid for the MSART plasmoids to be born in, and then some of the gases from the water are used and taken in by the plasmoids after the cavitation bubbles collapse. But this is apparently fairly negligible in terms of actual water volume lost in the reactions. So they had three separate gas analyzers hooked up to the retrofit exhaust during these trials, and we can see the most significant results recorded here. As per all of the previous trials, they're getting an astounding reduction in carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons, and a high increase in oxygen. We can see the results are actually a little better when the generator was tested under load, with the optimal load being 250 kilowatt. Here we can see uh, that under the 250 kilowatt load, carbon dioxide is down to 6.5%, carbon monoxide is at 0.03%, uh, hydrocarbons at 79 parts per million, and oxygen increased to 8.74%. And again, you can see some of these results being filmed live during the tests in Bob's videos. These aren't numbers they had to try to really hard to get all day either or anything. They correlate with all the other trials so far and they're typical for the thunderstorm generator as far as we can tell. We don't have any results on the fuel or output efficiency increases of the generator yet, but this is the next phase of these trials. It's all happening, so just be patient and we will see the results of these tests in due time. Another interesting thing to note uh, that is occurring on all the prototypes all of the existing carbon residue is being cleaned out of the engine and the exhaust after it's been run with a retrofit for a while. The engines are left completely clean. So you can see that this is not just some kind of weird hydrogen reaction going on here. There are plasmoids in the system and they're transmuting the carbon residue into oxygen or using the disassociated energy to feed and grow their own negatively charged containment fields. Another odd thing that happens if the engine is run for some time with a retrofit is that even once the retrofit is turned off, the engine continues to run cleaner. Malcolm says this is because the engine has been embedded with plasmoids, and I'm not hearing any better explanations. It's really quite astounding that this happens. So to quickly sum up what's going on here again, the hot exhaust gases are being introduced into the large outer sphere at an angle so that it's guided to spin around the sphere and into the pipe in a counterclockwise spiral. On the other end of the generator, the cold water gases and plasmoids are introduced into the inner sphere from the bubbler chamber, where they are guided to take a clockwise spiral around the sphere and into the other end of the pipe. 
Remember that the cold clockwise vortex is occurring inside the inner 18 inch sphere and 4 inch pipe, while the hot counterclockwise vortex is occurring inside the outer 24 inch sphere and the outer 6 inch pipe. So the two streams don't actually physically touch, they are separated by a layer of steel pipe. Despite this, there is an electromagnetic aspect to a thunderstorm, and this is what Malcolm is utilizing here. At some point in the pipe, the two vortexes meet and an event horizon occurs. We can call this the plane of inertia, where the counter-opposing electromagnetic force of the two vortexes cancel each other out and there is no motion, the eye of the hurricane. This is where the reaction occurs. As we know, just like ball lightning, Shamir plasmoids have their own homeostatic containment fields, which allow them to move and act through walls and solid steel without interacting with it. Wherever there is both a high positive charge and a high negative charge, there's always this, the desire for them to equalize. And this is, of course, what is going to happen here too. Lightning occurs and the gap between the opposing charges is bridged by the ionized path of the plasmoids. This reaction disassociates the carbon back into DC energy with no frequency, uh, which the plasmoids feed on to increase in size and charge. And any remaining disassociated protons, after the plasmoids are done feeding, is reconstructed into oxygen atoms, which continue to on to be ejected from the exhaust. This is the oxygen increase we're seeing in the exhaust gas analysis results I showed earlier. It's probably a little bit much for most of us to dwell on yet, but Malcolm explains that we're using this thunderstorm emulation to dilate time. In the outer pipe, we're accelerating time with the counterclockwise vortex. In the inner pipe, we're reversing time with the clockwise vortex. I think this quote from Malcolm can help make these ideas a little more comprehensible. In the universe, there are no straight lines. Everything that moves is moving in a curve. Every curve is part of a spiral. Every spiral is either imploding or exploding and therefore you have two distinct events. You have the life force, which is imploding and bringing everything together for life and planets to exist. Then you have the exploding death force, which is designed to redistribute things. Death and destruction is counterclockwise spin that is exploding and tearing things apart. If you're interested in the theory as well as the technology, you can probably see how simple yet profound this explanation is. A genuine unification of the principles of time, space, geometry, frequency, and fundamental physics presented through the practical technology. For those who have an academic background in this field, I highly encourage you to go and check out Bob Grinier's Conversations with Malcolm, uh, where he breaks down his own explanation of what is occurring. I personally love Malcolm's simple language and parables, and I'm studying directly under him to learn the science from that perspective. But Bob describes what's happening on a more rigorous and technical level that could help many scientists get up to speed on this new technology and give them some solid established research to start building on. So go check that out. Let's move on to take a look at the technical review of the thunderstorm generator recently published by Nikita Volk. Disclaimer, it's still a draft and it's an open document, so you can reach out to him if you have some valid and useful input and the relevant experience. I want to thank Nikita for all of his amazing work on this. He was one of the first qualified guys to turn up with his own tools and start verifying uh, this, so huge props to his passion and his open-mindedness as a scientist. Nikita is continuing his own personal trials on the tech, and I'm keeping an eye on that, so I'll try and keep you updated with his future experiment results too with his permission, of course. So I'll just give you a quick brief on what you'll find in this initial live open document, and then I'll leave you to go and check out the full paper for yourself. It's called A Review of the Gasoline Engine Vortex Tube Retrofit Waste Heat Recovery and Exhaust Retroforming System. And we can see here there is an introduction to the retrofit, and we can find a great schematic of the units and how they all fit together on page two, worth checking out. He goes on to give a thorough breakdown of what he believes is occurring in the reactions and then he takes a deep dive into each individual unit of the retrofit. First the UV air filter and then the bubbler and then the thunderstorm generator unit. And you can see he has some fantastic clearly labeled diagrams here that everyone should find very helpful. The remainder of the paper goes into a lot of technical detail and analysis of Nikita's experiments and results and if you've been waiting for some initial kind of rigorous down-to-earth science on this, here it is, you know, go check this out. It's a draft, um, but it's, it's really great, clear stuff. So big shout out to Nikita, Bob, and all of the other scientists who've put their time and effort into gathering more data around this. It's no longer just Malcolm alone trying to convince the world. 
I only featured a couple in this video, but I can say from first-hand knowledge that there are now a lot of driven individuals collectively making this happen. I'll be keeping you updated with their reviews and results as it all progresses. That's all for this update. Another one coming soon. Thanks for watching.